lead an expedition against it. This fortress was Masada. The honor of Rome was at stake. The rebels were a thorn in the side of Flavia Silva, who vowed he would go to any lengths to destroy them. However, he was faced with a seemingly impossible task. How could he mount a successful siege of Masada when faced with its overwhelming natural defenses? He would have to employ warfare technology first developed by the ancient Greeks, the masters of invention. The Greeks were a people far ahead of their time who made breathtaking advances in the fields of art, philosophy and science. But it was on the battlefield they truly showed their prowess and innovation. In Olympia, home of the gods, is a magnificent collection of early Greek armor. It's easy to imagine the Greek soldiers charging to battle two and a half thousand years ago. But it was their war machines which truly terrified their enemies. At Syracuse, on the island of Sicily, around 400 BC, the seeds were sown for the development of remarkable Greek war machines. Here the tyrant Dionysus the Elder summoned experts from Italy, Greece and Carthage to invent a range of weapons that struck fear into the hearts of fighting men throughout the Mediterranean world. The polemical mechanics, the polyorthodox mechanics, but especially the catapults, οι οποίοι άλλαξαν εντελώ το τοπίο του πολέμου. Δηλαδή, μέχρι την εποχή εκείνη το πόλεμο ήταν ξυφομαχία, κακό, ξέρω εγώ, και ε, ήταν πάλι ανθρώπου προ άνθρωπο. Με του καταπέλτε, από πολύ μακριά πια, ερχόταν ο κίνδυνο και μπορούσε, α πούμε, να προσβάλλει τον αντίπαλο από μεγάλη απόσταση και με πάρα πολύ μεγάλη δύναμη. Following the innovations at Syracuse, a variety of fearsome war machines were developed. The armies of Alexander the Great used both a rock-throwing siege engine and a catapult, which was the precursor of the crossbow, in the 3rd century BC. The ancients realized the power to harness fire would be crucial. In 424 BC, an early flamethrower was used in the Athens-Sparta war to burn down the wooden defenses of the city of Delium. These flamethrowers were fairly simple devices, a short, hollow tube with a burning cauldron of pitch and sulfur and charcoal at one end. Their range was quite short, about five meters. But in close quarters in naval combat, this was close enough to be able to set ablaze a hostile ship. The invention of ancient flamethrowers culminated in the elaborate designs of the Byzantines. This fire siphon of the 7th century AD used a large reservoir of liquid naphtha, or Greek fire. As this Renaissance manuscript illustrates, Greek fire was deployed as a dangerous weapon at sea. The modern equivalent today would be napalm. We imagine that machines which could project fire were an invention of the 20th century. Yet it's evident that for thousands of years, flamethrowers have been used in battle. These reconstructed Byzantine flamethrowers are examples of a simple but lethal weapon. We have to show you the flamethrower oil, the flamethrower oil, which, as you can see, has an envelope that is closed, it 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 is closed, το οποίο είναι ναύθα, έφλεκτο υγρό, το εκτοξεύει προς τον εχθρό. But were these amazing inventions really effective battlefield weapons? This model has been built to see if ancient flamethrowers really could have worked. What I'm holding here is a hypothetical reconstruction of a Byzantine flamethrowing weapon. We know that the Greeks had Greek fire, so it's not unreasonable to assume that there may have been smaller versions, such as this used by uh, maybe artillery troops. When many flamethrowers were used by an advancing army on the enemy, the effect must have been truly terrifying. The 
Greek fire which sprayed from these lethal machines was a sticky liquid that clung to the flesh of the enemy, burning them alive. The operational system of this is actually a simple siphon pump. As the piston is pumped backwards and forwards, the flammable fuel is ejected from a nozzle at the front and it's ignited by a small flame. The modern flamethrowers are based on a similar principle, similar flammable material, but theirs was a continuing pressure system. This simply works on a push stroke. The ancient Greeks passed their invention of early flamethrowers on to the Byzantines, who developed them further. But could the Greeks also have used handheld flamethrowers? The siphon technology used by Byzantine engineers was certainly known to ancient Greek scholars working in Alexandria, Egypt, hundreds of years earlier. One can only imagine how ancient flamethrowers would have been used on the battlefield over a thousand years ago. What is certain is that it would have been a devastating weapon. It's an example of warfare technology which was not invented in modern times, but reinvented. The deployment of flamethrowers to destroy key military assets on the battlefield is, I think, one of those intriguing examples of where an ancient technology has a truly modern use. The Romans also used fire as a weapon. However, in their siege of Masada in AD 73, they would have to deploy a whole range of other strategies and technologies to dislodge the desperate group of rebels from their mountain stronghold. Under their ruthless leader, Eliezer ben Yair, the rebels of Masada were becoming a symbol of resistance to Roman rule throughout the Mediterranean world. Back home in Rome, the defeat of the Jewish revolt had already been celebrated following the capture of Jerusalem. For the Roman army, failure was unthinkable. It was essential for the Romans to destroy these surviving resistance fighters. If they allowed even a few of them to escape, to Egypt, say, for example, then they would have fomented rebellion elsewhere. So this had to be a total clean-up. They must stop the enemy escaping. From their vantage point on top of Masada, the rebels watched as the Roman general Flavius Silva established his headquarters on the gently sloping hillside immediately opposite the palace. In the dry, rarefied air, they could even hear the orders shouted as the Romans built their camp. The Roman army was present at Masada in overwhelming force. In all, eight camps were needed to house them. Within the camps were areas for worship, a hospital, a forum or marketplace, and possibly even a brothel. I live in the field of oil. The oil of oil has been built by eight people, the Contabernium. In all the areas that are around us, היו עשרות אוהלים שבהם ישנו פחות או יותר כ-2,000 חיילים, חצי מהלגיון העשירי היה בנקודה הזאת. The rest of the 10th Legion, together with several thousand support troops, were distributed among seven other camps around Masada. The 10th Legion was spoiling for a fight. In an earlier battle against the Jews, they were disgraced by losing their standard, the Eagle, in battle. They were out for revenge. The men, women and children on top of Masada were only too aware of the might of the Roman army massing below them. They were here on the ground 960 people. This means that maybe there were 200 people that could be able to take care of them. Under us, we are between 7 to 8 thousand soldiers, legionaries, the Roman army was victorious at the siege of Jerusalem, but Masada had yet to fall. The Romans had the advantage of the best military logistics and the finest military planning in the ancient world. 
faced with the clifftop ramparts of the fortress of Masada, they decided to bring up their most powerful machines of war. These machines were missile throwing devices, the heavy artillery of the ancient world. Josephus, the Jewish historian, was awestruck by the power of these missile launchers. All the engines were admirably contrived, but especially those of the 10th Legion, which threw darts and stones and were larger and more powerful than the rest. They not only repelled the attacks of the Jews, but forced those which were lining the walls to take cover. הייתה קטפולטה שהיא אותה חיצים, והיה מכונת הבליסטרה שהיא אותה אבנים מגודל קטן נגד אנשים עד גודל של 25 קילו שיכלו ממש לשבור את החומות. שעמד כאן, הנקודה הזאת היא כל הזמן הופצצה על ידי כי, כמו שאמרתי, 50 או 60 מכונות שכל הזמן ירו על המרחב הזה. קיצור, זה לא, לא הייתה נקודה סימפטית לעמוד בה. Examples of these ancient Roman ballista balls can be found near cities all around the Mediterranean coast. Some excellent examples have recently been unearthed by Dr. George Steinhauer at Piraeus Harbour, southwest of Athens. These balls were found near the city of Piraeus. Είναι κατασκευασμένο από πέτρε και κυρίω από τι πέτρε που βρίσκονταν δίπλα στο τείχο. Χρησιμοποίησαν, όπω βλέπετε εδώ πέρα, ήταν από το νεκροταφείο τη πόλη έξω από τα τείχη, τα οποία κόπηκαν. Ήταν το υλικό που είχαν πρόχειρο. Some of the balls still carry marks indicating their weight. This was crucial not simply to ensure that they were used in the correct machine, but because any variation in weight would affect the ball's range. A good artillery man would adjust for it. According to the engineer Philon, the largest size of ballista in regular use by the Roman army could hurl a 26 kilogram stone missile approximately 200 meters. However, it is possible they built ballistas which could throw missiles of up to 78 kilograms. The impact on a city wall following a bombardment from one of these catapults would have been tremendous. Standing over eight meters tall, it was a true heavy artillery machine. According to Josephus, these Roman ballistas were easily capable of plowing through several ranks of enemy troops. Roman catapults were so advanced that their medieval counterparts, built 1400 years later, looked primitive in comparison. It's difficult to comprehend how much technical and engineering skill was lost when the Roman Empire finally fell apart. But in AD 73, the empire was still at its height. Jewish rebels besieged at Masada had nothing to compare with the range and power of the Roman weapons. They were armed only with simple slingshots. The weapon was placed in the pouch. There were two parts, one with a hole, and the other was a hole by the hole. And the attack was very simple. We put it in the pouch, we put it in the pouch, the pouch is broken, and then we put it in one, two, שלוש, בשלב הזה, הכלע מגיע למהירות של כמעט 96 קמ"ש, שאני עושה את זה במהירות, ואז אני משחרר. The Jews on Masada would have been pounded by the ballistas. Yet there is evidence of even more dangerous and sophisticated weapons which the Romans turned on their enemies. column in Rome are illustrations which show some of the more portable Roman artillery weapons. These smaller devices were usually fired from a standing position, but they could be mounted on carts and moved quickly when necessary. 
Although influenced by Greek inventions, the Romans created miniature versions which were more effective in battle. The scorpion, in particular, was a formidably efficient weapon, able to fire a heavy bolt over 500 meters. The scorpion, the small size of bolt shooter, was so called after the small creature. It had the deadly sting, and it was very portable. It was the favorite weapon of Caesar and many generals on the battlefield. The Greeks invented this type of artillery using rope power, rope springs, rope which was capable of a better and more efficient storage of energy than the equivalent weight today of spring steel. The rare find of a soldier's insignia ring has helped Alan Wilkins build a reconstruction of the lightest of the Roman bolt shooters, known as the Cairo Ballistra. The name means hand ballista, probably because it could be lifted up by one man and manhandled round the battlefield, which would be very useful. The ropes powering these machines were ideally made of animal sinew, but horse hair and even women's hair is said to have been used. The entire power of all these catapults depends on skeins of rope under tremendous stretch. A small carabalistra requires a third of a ton, 335 kilograms, to pull it back to full tension. The mechanism has a central sliding section, which holds the rope with a metal claw. The slider is cranked back, whilst a series of sloping teeth ensure it's held in place as the rope gradually reaches full stretch. When in the correct position, the bolt is loaded and a trigger pulled to release the claw holding the rope. The bolt exits the Cairo Ballistra at 120 miles per hour and would inflict terrible damage to any unprotected skull. The Romans created a machine not only capable of firing at incredible speeds, but with a missile which would cause maximum damage. The bolt has a similar effect to a modern dum-dum bullet. Its tip pierces the target, but the tail rips through the body at high speed, leaving a massive open wound. We measured both machines, and we found that for the Carabalistra, uh, the speed was in excess of 50 meters a second. For the much heavier bolt coming out of the Scorpion, it was 39 meters per second. Gruesome evidence of the damage that a bolt shooter could do has been found at Maiden Castle in Dorset, England. Here, a war cemetery has been discovered, which contains the skeletons of ancient Britons who we believe died defending their fortress against the Second Roman Legion under Vespasian. A bolt from a Roman weapon has been found still lodged in the spine of the unfortunate warrior. The skull of another shows clear evidence of a direct hit from a Roman bolt. The missile must have been traveling at a high speed to pierce the bone without shattering it. When the scorpion is fired against a cow's skull, it would be similar to the damage inflicted on a human skull. The chilling power of this Roman war machine is clear. But what happened when a piece of Roman artillery fell into enemy hands and was used against the Romans themselves? Would their sophisticated body armor protect them against it? At 120 miles per hour, high-speed photography reveals how the armor absorbs the impact. Yet another reason for Roman military supremacy throughout the Mediterranean. A trained artilleryman could fire a hand ballista bolt at the rate of five per minute. And of course, he wouldn't be working alone. These machines, of course, were many in number, 55 mobile, heavy-duty bolt-shooting machines in every legion. So if you have three legions, you've got uh, 165 
machines firing heavy bolts all at once in salvo. We think that laying down a huge and terrifying barrage of missiles is a characteristic of modern warfare. But the Roman army at Masada was adopting the same strategy nearly 2,000 years ago. Flavius Silva needed to find some way of getting Roman troops into the fortress. And to do that, he needed to get a battering ram up to the wall. Battering rams have been used in sieges from the earliest classical times but almost all have been lost. The only surviving example of a battering ram head is the one from Olympia, which is a bronze rectangular sheath with two rows of teeth at the front, which suggests perhaps it was for demolishing a mud brick wall. This ram was discovered at Olympia in the 1890s. It is beautifully preserved showing clearly the head of a ram cast in bronze on either side. But soldiers wielding a ram were highly vulnerable to missiles thrown or dropped from the city walls. Many ingenious methods were used to protect the soldiers using the ram, such as a housing around the mechanism. Although a seemingly simple concept, battering rams reached their peak of sophistication in a remarkable ancient Greek weapon bearing an uncanny resemblance to the modern tank. It was invented by a little-known engineer, Hegator. It is named Hegator's Ram Tortoise. Hegator's Ram Tortoise is principally a battering ram. Normally, ram tortoises would be protected by covering fire from the rear, catapults, archers in the rear. This particular machine had on board a battery of catapults, so providing its own protection. This extraordinary ram tortoise was made of wood and protected with iron plates and bags of seaweed which were kept wet as a protection against attempts to set it on fire. Hecator's ram tortoise was an important military asset in siege warfare. It could be brought to batter the gates of a hostile city. Seeing the ram tortoise moving across the battlefield must have inspired fear in the onlookers, something like the appearance in modern warfare of a battalion of tanks. The ram tortoise was such a fearsome weapon that special sabotage techniques were created as a countermeasure to it. There are reports of an early type of minefield consisting of large earthenware jars buried in the ground which collapsed when the weight of the ram tortoise passed over them. This ambitious structure, with a ram estimated at 31 meters long, trundled slowly across the battlefield with teams of men on board to shoot catapults, maneuver it and operate the ram. Much later, medieval battering rams seemed no match for their ancient counterparts, and yet even the ram tortoise was not the most fearsome weapon the ancient world had to offer. The Helepolis, the city taker, was said to be nine stories high and filled with lethal weapons. It was built by a Greek engineer, Epimachus, for the siege of Rhodes in 304 BC. Rhodes was a powerful commercial and cultural center and controlled trade throughout the Aegean. The man who led the assault on Rhodes was the son of one of Alexander the Great's generals. When Demetrius Polyarchetes decided to besiege Rhodes, he initially launched a naval assault on the harbor. The Rhodians successfully repulsed this assault, so he changed tack and assaulted the landward side of the city. In order to do this, he uh, commissioned the Athenian engineer Epimachus to build a Helepolis, the largest one ever known. 
The Rhodes Helepolis was said to be approximately 40 meters in height and towered over the walls of the city. Thought to weigh up to 160 tons, it was one of the first examples of the use of armor plating, which was fitted on three sides to protect it from the Rhodian stone throwers and blazing bolts. Its apertures or windows had movable visors so the catapults could be shielded when not actually shooting. It was a magnificent sight. Σε κάθε όροφο υπήρχαν καταπέλτες, βαλίστες κλπ. Και, και, και στον τελευταίο όροφο απάνω φτάνανε οι στρατιώτες από εσωτερικές σκάλες, οπότε ρίχνανε σκάλα στα τείχη και πορθίζανε την πόλη. Ήταν φοβερό όπλο, φοβερό όπλο. The mystery about the Helepolis was how such an unwieldy machine could possibly have moved. Yet it seems it was designed to do so. It would have been terrifying to the inhabitants of Rhodes. Chiefly, the Helepolis was bringing overwhelming firepower towards an enemy town. But of course, there's the psychological effect of such a massive machine inching slowly towards you. We can only imagine the terror that must have been struck into the heart of the Rhodian defenders when they saw this great structure bristling with armaments rolling towards their walls. Few must have thought the city would survive. Yet the city did survive. Although Renaissance reports of its size must be exaggerated, the Rhodes Helepolis appears too large to move successfully. This may have been its downfall. The Rhodians managed to loosen some of its armor and set it alight. However, it was able to destroy some of the city towers and walls, the remains of which can still be seen around Rhodes today. The Romans, for their part, preferred smaller, more manageable siege towers, often constructed on the spot. But the precipitous cliffs around Masada made it seemingly impossible to maneuver a siege tower up to the walls. The rebels, trapped in the palace fortress, battered as they were by seven weeks of artillery bombardment, felt confident that at least they did not have to come face to face with a Roman siege tower. But they were soon to be proved wrong. The Romans realized the only answer was to get on top. So they built a 90-foot high siege tower, uh, covered on the front, certainly, with heavy iron plates, with various stories of archers and catapults. But, of course, that was 250 meters below the top. So they built the impossible. Flavius Silva ordered a massive ramp to be built so his siege tower could reach Masada's walls, as Josephus recalled. From the top of the hill to the west, there was a certain eminency of rock, very broad and very prominent, but 300 cubits below the highest point of Masada. Accordingly, he got upon that part of the rock and ordered the army to bring earth, and the bank became raised and solid for 200 cubits in height. The remains of Flavius Silva's ramp can still be clearly seen. Josephus Kotev, she Silva Flavius, a mafaked da Romi, is to let alea, mimena emutsiu ta far, ruim adayom et taktaim she chasirim, ve ta far aze ulakach, ve irvid banikuda she nimtset karega letsidenu. אנחנו יכולים לראות את טכניקת הבנייה פה בצורה מאוד יפה, וזה אחד המקומות היותר מרגשים. ממש אפשר לראות את העץ והענפים שנחרטו בנחלים שנמצאים באזור. שמו אותם שורות שורות, רואים פה חתיכת עץ עוד אחת עוד אחת, על גבי זה שפכו את החול והאבנים שחפרו מאחורינו, ובעצם לאט לאט התקדמו עד שהגיעו כ-20 מטר ממצדה. This prodigious feat of building is still awe-inspiring today, even after 2,000 years of erosion have done their work. It took many months to build, but by May, AD 73, they were ready to roll this giant siege tower up a sort of log trackway so that they could start to attack the wall and bring a, a battering ram to bear. of successful resistance to the might of the Roman army. Never more so than at Syracuse in Sicily, home of the mathematical genius Archimedes. Archimedes is known as a mathematician. 
αλλά τον εκλαμβάνω σαν έναν από τους μεγάλους μηχανικούς της, της αρχαίας Ελλάδας. Ο Αρχιμήδης είχε επινοήσει μια σειρά από όπλα με τα οποία προσπαθούσε να βοηθήσει την πόλη του να αμυνθεί και να μην καταληφθεί από τους Ρωμαίους. One of Archimedes' stranger inventions was the Arpagus crane, described by Plutarch as a contraption which was pushed out over the city walls and which grabbed the prow of a ship with an iron hand before lifting it and plunging it deep into the sea. The Romans weren't used to dealing with such an ingenious enemy and they lived in fear of Archimedes' new inventions. Ήταν τόσο μεγάλο ο τρόμο των Ρωμαίων ε, με όλα αυτά τα που είχε επινοήσει ο Αρχιμίδη στη διάρκεια τη πολιορκία των Σιγαρουσών, ώστε όταν βλέπαν έναν άντρα, λέει, ηλικιωμένο με λευκά μαλλιά να περπατάει πάνω στα τείχη των Σιγαρουσών, φοβόντουσαν και φεύγανε. Λέει, Να ο Αρχιμίδη, πάλι πάμε να φύγουμε, δεν θα κάνουμε πάλι τίποτα. There is great debate as to whether some of Archimedes' weapons are the stuff of history or myth. One of the most contentious inventions is the extraordinary weapon known as Archimedes' steam cannon. Many experts simply cannot believe that anyone could have invented a steam-powered weapon more than 200 years BC. Yet it's clear that the ancient Greeks knew how to harness the power of steam. Heron of Alexandria invented the steam ball, believed to be the first steam engine in history. Even the great Leonardo da Vinci believed Archimedes' steam cannon could have existed. Leonardo da Vinci, από ό,τι γνωρίζουμε, είχε στην κατοχή του χειρόγραφα προφανώς του Αρχιμήδη. Τρία από αυτά βρέθηκαν στη βιβλιοθήκη του, τα οποία τα χρησιμοποίησε για να ανακατασκευάσει το κανόνι. 35 years ago, Professor Ioannis Sakas, a leading Greek engineer and leading Archimedes expert, became convinced that Archimedes had indeed invented a cannon powered by steam. Ο Σακάς ήταν ένας Έλληνας μηχανικός, ο οποίος έταξε τη ζωή του ακριβώς στο να ανακατασκευάζει έργα του Αρχιμήδους. Ήταν ένα μοντέλο, ένα προς πέντε, δεν ήταν πάρα πολύ μεγάλο. The results were surprising. Κάποια στιγμή λοιπόν με τη βαλβίδα αυτή μεταφέρεται ο ατμός μέσω αυτού εδώ του διάβλου και μπουμ, εκτόξευε την, την πέτρινη της σφαίρα σε απόσταση 300 με 400 μέτρων. Ιωάννης Σάκας' home movies show one of his successful experiments with the steam cannon. But could the same experiment be repeated today? For the first time in over 30 years, we put Archimedes' steam cannon to the test. Richard Windley, an ancient technology model maker, has built the steam cannon based on Professor Sakas's original designs. The vessel at the back here is made of heavy-duty steel, probably bronze in Archimedes' time. There's a sub substantial amount of metal there which absorbs massive quantities of heat from the fire. The pressure vessel remains empty until the point of firing, when a small amount of water is dropped via the valve onto the very hot metal inside, creating a build-up of steam pressure. The ball sits in the barrel towards the end of the cannon and is held against a collar just at the front of the pressure vessel. It's actually held in place by a wooden rod which runs the length of the barrel. The critical piece of equipment is this brake bar at the front, which holds everything in place until the pressure reaches a predetermined limit when the bar breaks and the ball is then free to fly out of the barrel at high velocity. It's astonishing to think that Archimedes could have invented such an apparently modern cannon over 2,000 years ago. The early Greeks were perfectly aware of the um, principles involved. We're talking about huge pressures in these pressure vessels. This is running at a very modest pressure, but it would have been a, a mammoth task to produce the kind of results which are discussed by some of the ancient writers. Massive weights being hurled through huge distances.
The success of Archimedes' various war machines eventually persuaded the Romans to abandon the assault on Syracuse and attempt to take it by blockade. But at Masada in AD 73, the Jewish rebels did not have access to the great war machines of Archimedes. They were faced with an advancing army who were technologically superior and who vastly outnumbered them. The Romans had spent weeks building a ramp to the fortress. Finally, they were ready to advance right up to Masada's walls. <laughs> הגובה בערך כ-20-25 מטרים של מגדל, אל המצור הענק בראשו, והם מתחילים לקעקע פה את החומה. פשוט מכים ומכים ומכים עד שהחומה מתפרקת. The rebels made one last attempt to stop the Romans. The defenders of Masada cunningly constructed a timber-laced earthwork against which the battering ram was powerless. So Silva had to resort to fire. But the fire, which had started to consume the wooden frame barricades erected by the rebels, was blown back onto the Roman siege tower. Josephus, the historian, described the scene. When the wall caught fire, a north wind started to blow that blew down upon the Romans, so that they feared that their machines would themselves be burned. But soon after, the wind changed and blew from the south, so that the wall was soon ablaze throughout its entire thickness. So the Romans returned to their camp with joy, resolving to attack their enemies the very next day. And they set their guard more carefully that night, lest any of the Jews should escape. But there would be no escape for the rebels trapped at Masada. <laughs> ובעצם ברגע הזה מתחולל שיא הדרמה שעליה אנחנו יודעים רק מהמקור ההיסטורי. יוספוס כותב שהיהודים מתכנסים, רק הגברים מתכנסים באחד הארמונות ומחליטים להפיל גורל, מחליטים להתאבד. The rebel leader Eliezer ben Yair would not allow his men and their families to fall into the brutal hands of the Roman army. They would rather die by their own hand than suffer such humiliation. They would die with dignity and steal from the Romans their great victory at Masada. The Roman general Flavius Silva waited below Masada that night for his victory, relishing the conquest which was within his grasp. In the fortress, the rebels drew lots to decide which ten of them would kill their fellow Jews. Josephus described the tragic scene. Every man of them laid himself down by his wife and children on the ground, and they offered their necks to the stroke of those chosen to carry out the deed. And when these ten had without fear slain them all, they made the same rule for casting lots for themselves, to choose that man whose lot it was to kill the other nine, and who should then kill himself. When the Roman troops entered Masada next morning, according to the historian Josephus, everyone had committed suicide. Shuv, we don't know who was the last one, but it doesn't change the fact that the Romans came to the front and took the fire and took the fire and took the fire here after a half a year, after a half a year, they were stuck here in the midbar. Approximately 960 Jewish men, women and children died at Masada. No one was left to fight the Roman army. The rebels had taken from the Romans the glory of a bloody and victorious battle. Only two women and their children are believed to have escaped by hiding in the palace water systems. Masada has become an important symbol of Jewish independence and nationhood. Yet, without the writings of Josephus, we may never have known the story of the rebels or the military firepower the Romans used against them. The Roman capture of Masada underlines something important about the Roman war machine. It emphasizes that the Romans knew 
about the importance of careful, advanced military planning and also about the importance of investing in superior military technologies. In terms of manpower, resources and technology, the Roman army would not be matched again in Europe until the 19th century armies of Wellington and Napoleon. Over 2,000 years ago, first the ancient Greeks and then the Romans recognized that war machines were crucial to their success. They would develop cutting-edge technology to crush their enemies. And in doing so, they would lay the foundations of modern warfare in the ancient world.